Today we'll start memory hierarchy and caches. Again, this is another area that's very exciting to lots of people. And it's a huge area. For the rest of the semester, we'll cover mainly the memory hierarchy, caches, interconnects, memory controllers, DRAM, and maybe even some emerging technologies. OK. But before that, you know that you have a homework five due April 1st. And lab assignment five, start early. This is a switch uh, because you'll need to actually do caches and branch prediction. And hopefully you know what caches are. Well, you'll learn about them today if you don't know what they are. An extra credit will be cache design optimization. And I've already talked about this. And I believe TAs will go over the baseline simulator in the discussion session. So if you have questions, uh, definitely ask the TAs. Google 5 says, say it again. Google 5 is you on third. Homework 5 is due on 3rd, April 3rd. I thought it was April 1st. It was released that's two days later. Oh, OK, that's right, yeah. You're, it's OK. I mean, we can make it April 3rd. Again, the purpose of the homeworks is for your benefit. Is it, if it's April 3rd, then it's go with the website. <laughs> OK. OK, these are the readings that you've been doing for this lecture. And today we'll cover, we'll start with the memory hierarchy first and then jump into caches. But there is also today the Oracle Tech Day. How many of you have received email about it? Yeah, this goes to everyone, right? I'd encourage you to attend. This should be exciting. There are a bunch of senior, uh, as well as junior Oracle engineers and researchers that will be attending. You'll get a chance to interact with them personally. And I know several of them personally. Some of them are CMU graduates. Uh, and some of them interact with my group regularly, too. So this should be something fun, I think. Uh, it's from 4.30 to 6.30 PM at the Singleton Room. And they titled it, What Keeps, Keeps Us Up at Night? I guess what's keeping you up at night is 4.47, probably. But <laughs> what's keeping them up at night, so you'll probably figure it out. But I looked at their announcement, and some of the things that uh, struck me where they say, hardware and software engineers must balance customers' wants and needs with an eye towards the future and make the right choices and trade-offs today for how technologies will unfold in the next five years. That's what computer architecture is about also. And I guess computer architecture is also about, even in industry, a solution may arise only after many sleepless nights. <laughs> so they'll probably talk about those sleepless nights. And you can exchange some information about what those sleepless nights are. Uh, and uh, there will be engineers from database and different kinds of databases, Solaris operating systems, virtualization, and even architecture. It's a big company that spans different parts of the stack. So this should be interesting. You could even talk, to, talk about the architecture team, maybe explore some opportunities with them. And apparently, they'll have a presentation followed by a one-hour reception, uh, where Oracle engineers are available for ample discussion and commiseration. So. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll be fun. I try, I'll try to be there also uh, to commiserate with fellow engineers, but <laughs> we'll see if I can make it. <laughs> OK. Actually, we've covered, uh, we've covered the Niagara design at some point, right? When we talked about fine grained multi threading, if you remember that. That's actually Sun's Niagara design. But Oracle's uh, T4 uh, employs a lot of the concepts that we've discussed in this lecture. I, believe, I don't believe that they're fine-grained multi-threaded, but they do employ the out-of-order execution. Uh, and you can talk to one of the engineers over there in, in, from the Spark architecture to see what kind of techniques they employ in their uh, designs today. Should be fun. OK. Well, I guess what keeps me up at night is the thought of how can we achieve better a more ideal system. Uh, and this is my way of looking at a computing system. You, think of, uh, you can think of instruction supply, instructions going into the pipeline. You need to supply them somehow. And you need to execute those instructions. But when you're executing those instructions, those instructions operate on data, which means that you need to supply the data as well. right? So far, we've covered this pipeline for a while. right? We talked about it a lot. We didn't talk about instruction and data supply a lot. Now we're going to move on to instruction and data supplies. But let's, take a, let's remember what we looked at in the pipeline for a little bit. Ideally, we would like all of these components to be ideal. And what does it mean for the pipeline to be ideal? 
Well, no pipeline stalls, right? And we looked at many mechanisms to uh, minimize the pipeline stalls. Uh, perfect data flow. We want to have perfect data flow, data flowing from one function unit to another very quickly, right? Uh, very quickly means you need zero cycle interconnect somehow. And you don't want additional dependencies also. We tried eliminating those dependencies to enable perfect data flow, right? Of course, you need enough functional units to be able to execute independent operations in parallel. And we spent a lot of time on that. And you ideally want zero latency compute, right? If you have that, that would be nice. So ideal pipeline, we've tried to achieve this ideal pipeline with many different ways. Maybe not the zero latency compute, but that's a, that's a tougher one. You need to do computation, right? It's, it's hard to get zero latency. But I, I'd encourage you to think about, uh, whenever you design a system, I'd encourage you to think about how can we achieve close to the ideal. We're going to do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to start the memory lectures the same way. In an instruction supply, we've covered part of this, right? Ideally, you would like zero cycle latency, right? You'd like an instruction right away. Uh, you would like infinite capacity so that you don't take instruction cache misses or you don't need to, uh, your code fits in the instruction supply. And we've tried to achieve that with virtual memory, right? Virtual memory gives that illusion. Uh, and we would like zero cost, of course. Zero cost is true for everything, actually. Uh, and we're all engineers. Engineering means uh, doing the same thing at much lower costs, right? Achieving some uh, goal at much lower cost, ideally zero. And perfect control flow, we've tried to do that a lot on the instruction supply. Data supply is similar. You'd like zero cycle latency, infinite capacity, zero cost, infinite bandwidth also. That could be true for the instruction supply as well. These are not exhaustive necessarily. There's no control flow problem in the data supply, but you would like uh, an instruction can generate lots of work on the, memory, uh, on the data supply, right? If you remember the, in a GPU, for example, a vector instruction, a single instruction, the instruction supply is not necessarily a bottleneck there, but a single instruction can generate requests for millions or even billions of data elements, right? If that's the case, now your data supply becomes bottleneck, so you need a lot of bandwidth. So bandwidth tends to be a much bigger problem at the data supply level. That's why I put bandwidth uh, over here. But these are parts of the memory system, your instruction supply and data supply. And we'd like to try to make it ideal. So let's start with the memory hierarchy. Let me give you this picture first that I like. This is what memory looks like in a modern system. This is a multi-core chip. This is AMD's Barcelona chip. It's, much, it's very old now. Uh, it's hard to keep up with these new chips that keep coming up. But you have these cores, four cores in this case. And if you look at the chip, most of the chip is really dedicated to the memory hierarchy. Actually, this is, these are some hefty cores. That's why cores are big. But you have the L2 caches. I've ignored the L1 caches here, and we'll see why I've ignored them. Because L1 caches are very tightly coupled to the pipeline. You may not even want to think of them as part of the memory hierarchy, in a sense, because a lot of the choices you make when you design an L1 cache are really dictated by the core itself, because you would like to get the data very quickly to the instructions that are going to use that data, that depend on that data. And if you make that L1 cache really large, then you have a problem, because you cannot get the data in quickly. And you would like to have it operate on the frequency, uh, at the frequency of the core so that you don't incur additional overheads for crossing different uh, cycle times, right? So L1 caches are here, but they're not shown. Actually, you can probably guess what are the L1 caches here. I'm not going to venture that guess. Uh, but, and then you, you have L2 caches, and then you have some shared L3 caches, memory controller, interface to the DRAM, and the, the off-chip DRAM itself. So if you look at this, most of this is memory, and it's shared. And keep this in mind, we're going to, cover all of these different components as we go along in the rest of the lecture. Here, one thing I do not show here is the interconnect. And some of these parts, some of these parts actually interconnect. Obviously, these, need, these things need to be connected, right? L0, L1 caches need to be connected to the L2 caches. Those need to be connected to the shared L3 cache. That needs to be connected to the memory control. So there's a lot of interconnect going on here. And that interconnect is also important. How do you route the data? What kind of interconnect do you use? Do you actually have all of the L2 caches uh, connected point to point to the shared L3 cache, or is there a single bus that connects uh, these L2 caches to the shared L3 cache? 
Now you can start imagining the trade-offs, right? If you have a single bus, uh, what if two of these L2 caches, L2 cache 0 and 1, need to access the L3 cache at the same time? Well, too bad. There's a single bus, right? They, they get serialized, which means that this has an impact on performance, right? And as you keep adding more cores, do you keep that single bus? Well, in this case, they don't have a single bus. They do actually have a crossbar in this chip. Uh, and we'll see the crossbar interconnect. That enables a lot more bandwidth, which means that these different caches can generate their request to the shared L3 cache at the same time. Uh, they don't get serialized. So that interconnect we'll also cover in a later lecture. Uh, and there are lots of design choices in all of these different uh, parts of the hierarchy. For example, uh, one design choice is L2 cache uh, zero in this, in this uh, case, uh, the architects decided to make the L2 cache private to the core, which means that only this core can access L2 cache zero. Whereas L3 cache is shared across the cores, which means that all cores can bring data into the L3, L3 cache. Now, what are the trade offs between private versus shared? We'll see that later on. And all cores share the memory controller, uh, and we'll see issues related to that, how this memory controller does scheduling. And we'll also see how the DRAM banks are organized. But let's first start, well, obviously, it's a hierarchy, right? There is a hierarchy here. You have uh, the registers inside here, and then L L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, memory. Why do we have that hierarchy? Well, the need for the hierarchy actually comes from that idealism, right? Ideally, we would like zero access time, zero latency, infinite capacity, zero cost, and infinite bandwidth. And you cannot get it all. Uh, with, a, with a monolithic design. By having a hierarchy, we're, trying to, we're going to try to approximate all of that. And uh, the, the reason is ideal memory's requirements oppose each other. If you look at any of these, and if you try to get all of them, you'll have to give up at least one or two. Why? Uh, because bigger is slower, right? That's very fundamental. And faster is more expensive in general. Uh, there are multiple reasons for this. And higher bandwidth is also more expensive. If you want to provide many different accesses in parallel, then you need to add multiple ports, right? And we've seen this in the vector processor or SIMD processor design. Those ports are expensive. It's not, they don't come uh, for free. So you cannot get fast and high capacity, low cost, and infinite bandwidth at the same time, right? Well, why, why is bigger slower? Because it takes longer to determine the location, right? You need to decode the address. And also, we'll see a generic memory design. You need to bring the data. If, if it's very big, now you need somehow that data needs to be driven out of the memory chip. It takes longer. Why is faster more expensive? Well, uh, faster, one of the reasons why things are fast is because they're small, right? Uh, small uh, is, I guess small could be cheaper, you could argue. But if you want to put more capacity into it, then it becomes more expensive. And fast uh, speed is actually usually determined by the memory technology, given the same capacity. If you have two, capa uh, two memory chips that are of the same capacity, how do you make a speed difference? Speed difference actually comes from the technology that's employed. And SRAM is usually much faster than DRAM. And there are other technologies, for example, uh, uh, flash memory. That's another technology that's usually slower. And the hard disks, they use, uh, th th those are even slower. So as you change the technology, you also make a trade-off in speed. And we'll see SRAM versus DRAM uh, first. And higher bandwidth is more expensive because of what I said. You need to get higher bandwidth, you can employ many different techniques. You need more banks. You can have more ports. You can have higher frequency. Or again, you can have faster technology, right? A faster technology provides you high bandwidth because it can pump out data much more quickly because the latency is lower. And you can pipeline things faster. So this is, these are all expensive. And we'll cover ways of achieving uh, this as well. So let's start with uh, two technologies, two fundamental technologies that are used in today's systems. You all know about DRAM, right? Dynamic random access memory. Have you taken circuit classes to see how it works? OK, I'm going to go relatively fast. But DRAM uh, basically uh, data is stored in this capacitor. And the, uh, whether or not this capacitor is charged or discharged indicates whether or not you have a 1 or 0 uh, stored. And you have one capacitor. One capacitor enables the storage of a single bit. And you need to somehow access it, right? You cannot just have one capacitor and look at it. Somehow you need to figure out if it's charged or discharged. 
So we need peripheral circuitry to access this. And the idea is you have an access transistor that enables this charge to be driven onto the bit line uh, or uh, that enables something on the bit line to be driven into the capacitor. An access transistor is enabled uh, with some, what is called a word line or a row enable signal. After address is decoded, if the address matches this uh, cell, then this access transistor is enabled, and then the capacitor is connected to the bit line. And you could be reading or writing, right? And how does the reading or writing happen? Well, it all depends on the sharing of the charge between the bit line uh, and the capacitor, right? It all depends on who will drive the bit line, right? Uh, depending on the charge status. So when you're reading, capacitors charges discharged onto the bit line, and there's a sense amplifier at the bottom that senses that charge to figure out if it's a zero or one. When you're writing, the value on the bit line dr is driven into the capacitor, and the capacitor is either charged or discharged depending on the value on the bit line. So that's how it operates. It's very simple, very fundamental, uh, nice, clean. The problem is this capacitor, even if, even when you, you have not enabled this row enable signal, it actually leaks through this path, right? The transistor is not a perfect switch. There's leakage that happens through the transistor. And as a result, the EM cell loses charge over time. So over time, even if you've charged it fully, even if it's at VDD, at some point it becomes zero. And we'll see uh, things. Which means that you need to refresh this DRAM cell to keep your data inside here. And this is one fundamental uh, difference between DRAM and SRAM. The other difference is you can make this capacitor actually really small. And uh, you have only one access transistor. So this can be made really, really small. Well, we'll see the differences. So let's take a look at SRAM. This is static random access memory. Uh, it's not dynamic. It's really not, uh, it doesn't have this dynamic behavior of leaking charge. Basically, data is stored in two cross-coupled inverters. This is how you store a single bit. Right? Basically, you trap, uh, trap the value in these two cross-coupled in inverters. And you have a feedback path that enables a stored value to persist in the cell. Because what happens, you don't lose charge because these amplify the value because of that feedback path. Right? In fact, a sense amplifier is essentially an SRAM cell. How do you sense the charge over here? You have a sense amplifier that looks very much like this. OK. Well, of course, you cannot just look at this again. You somehow need to access how do you get the data out of here. Well, uh, now you need, uh, again, the bit lines to sense uh, what data is stored, and you have a bit line and a bit line bar, and you do differential sensing normally uh, to figure out what the value is inside the cell. And you also need to enable, uh, enable this cell, right? Uh, how, again, uh, enable the reading or the writing uh, of the cell using this row select signal, which is, again, the same as the word line, right? Row enable, row select, it's the same thing. Or this is also called a word line, uh, which word in a bunch of words are you selecting. <clears throat> so if you look at this, you have four transistors for storage and two transistors for access. Right? And why do we have four transistors? Because inverters can be implemented with two transistors. right? So this is a six transistor cell. Well, this tells you that it's much bigger to begin with. Right? And it's, it cannot be as dense as DRAM. OK. So uh, let's t uh, if you look at a generic memory, Based on these cells, this, uh, using these cells, you can build generic memories. And this is uh, the organization of a generic memory bank. A bank consists of two-dimensional uh, storage array, where each location in this array is a cell. So you could replicate these in, a, in, in two dimensions, and you will get a bank of SRAM. And you can get a bank of DRAM also. Right? Uh, and uh, you have rows of cells as well as columns of cells. To access, normally what happens is you need to send the row address. This row address is decoded and it could be latched also. Uh, and this row decoder drives one of the word lines or row select signals. Basically, after decoding, one, rows, uh, one row of cells, uh, access transistors are enabled because that word line uh, is raised. If you will, that word line uh, becomes enabled. Now, what does this mean? This means that uh, 
a row of cells, and you can think of a row, let's say, two kilobits or four kilobits, let's say. All those four kilobits, uh, 4,096 cells, uh, now drive their access transistors, which means that charge sharing happens between each cell and the bit line. And those selected bits drive the bit lines. So entire row is read out uh, of memory. And there are sense amplifiers that amplify the uh, data if needed. That amplification happens uh, using special sample amplifiers at the bottom of a DRAM cell, and we will see that. That amplification happens using differential sensing in an SRAM cell uh, to uh, figure out what the data is. And at the end, you, you get the entire row uh, values, ones and zeros, at the bottom of the array. Now you need to select which column you're accessing. You don't access four kilobits at a time, right? Somehow you need to select which column you're accessing, and that happens after the decoding of the column uh, bits of the address. And that selected address is sent to the output. And at the end, you need to somehow uh, restore the state of memory such that you can enable it for the next read, right? Now what you've done is uh, bit lines have changed, right? Their values have changed. So to prepare uh, the array for the next read, these bit lines need to be pre-charged to a, to a reference value. For example, in DRAM, that reference value is VDD over 2. It doesn't have to be that. You, you just, you can, uh, VDD over 2 is in between VDD and 0. So you can easily distinguish between VDD and 0, right? 1 over 0. Okay? So this is very generic. All memories, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say all memories, all charge-based memories operate this way. Because we may at some point look at memories that are more resistive. And in that case, you don't really, uh, what you, uh, detect is the resistance of the cell rather than the charge. If you look at this, we're actually detecting is the cell charged? What is the, how much charge there is in the cell? But some more scalable memories, scalable meaning some memories that seem to, uh, where, where, uh, where we seem to be able to reduce the size of it much better, uh, seem, are, are resistive. One example is phase change memory. And the idea over there is you have this material, chalcogonite glass, and uh, by heating up that material uh, and melting it, you change its state. And you can have two different states. One is high resistance and one is low resistance. And you, can, you get to these different states by applying different levels of current and for different amounts of time. Now, if, if you go to these two states, one is high resistance, one is low resistance, you can just detect the resistance of the cell. And that tells you, uh, what is the value stored, one or zero? It's different from this, right? Here, you have charge. And charge is easy to think about, probably. But I'll, I'll encourage you to think about what is, how do you detect the resistance, right? Well, you've probably done, done that in your circuit classes, right? So, uh, think, but you can organize that memory this way also. Now your cells are, uh, that uh, cells that con contain that chalcogonite glass material instead of, this, or instead of this. And now you bring a row of data, and you, instead of amplifying it, instead of charge sharing, you just have some, some things that detect the resistance. So this is a very generic memory. You can build any memory to operate this way. Maybe the details will be a little bit different. Okay? So let's take a look at SRAM. SRAM uh, is, uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly, because I've already given you the basic principles. But usually what you try to do is, uh, you try to uh, minimize, to minimize the overall latency, you try to make this a uh, square. You try to um, uh, equalize n and m. And n is the number of bits that is used for uh, the row of address. m is the number of bits that's used for the column address. And read sequence, you decode the address, drive the row select. And selected bit lines drive the bit lines. You read the entire row together. And you do differential sensing for the bit lines and select one of the columns at the end. And data is ready. At the end, bit lines are pre-charged so that next read or write uh, happens correctly. And access latency is usually dominated by how fast you can drive this row as well as how fast you can drive these bit lines, which means steps two and three. Why? Because those are the long interconnects, right, if you look at this. And cycling time, cycle time is again dominated by two, three, and five. Pre-charging also uh, is long because 
uh, cycling time means uh, when, it, when can you start the next access after this access? Because until you pre-charge all the bit lines and prepared it for the next access, you cannot uh, access the array again. Yes? How do you write that? Like, oh. You can row select and read from the bit line, but then how do you write that? Uh, how, how do you write that? Uh, basically, uh, you need to uh, prepare the bit line such that they can drive. So if the bit line charge is higher than the charge that's here, you can drive it. Does that make sense? So if the bit line uh, charge is different, uh, the charge here drives the bit line. You need to ensure that the bit line can drive the cell itself. So it's all about charge sharing. Yeah. Make sense? OK. You can design it in different ways, actually. You can actually have some write-enable circuitry also, but that's expensive. OK. And this is the uh, DRAM cell. Again, very similar. Uh, well, in SRAM cell, actually, you can supply, uh, because SRAM is actually fast, and you normally try um, uh, to get the, uh, get the data very quickly, uh, you can supply both the, um, and you, you normally use SRAM on chip. Uh, these, uh, you can supply the entire address at the same time, this N and M at the same time uh, to uh, the SRAM chip. Whereas DRAM, one difference in general is uh, you latch uh, the row address, and then after that, you latch the column address. Uh, so basically, first, uh, well, uh, I'll ignore that for now, but uh, first, you send the N bits for the row address. And while that decoding is happening, uh, you send the column bits for the next m bits. Can anybody guess why, why that's the case? Yes. You use like a smaller address for it. Exactly, yes. Because DRAM is usually off chip, right? And it's very expensive to have ports to send the address. What we're doing is basically we have a smaller address port and time multiplexing the trans transmittal of n and m over that address port. Now you have smaller address port on the DRAM side, as well as smaller address uh, lines uh, on the memory controller side. And because that's the uh, costly part, one of the costly part of the systems, because you're adding more pins if you add more address uh, bits. Whereas SRAM, because it's on chip, these are adding more wires, and wires are much cheaper than pins, okay? Again, you try to minimize the overall latency here. Uh, and we'll see the structure of a DRAM, but this is the structure of a single DRAM bank. Well, you can have many, many banks. Okay, I think I've already given uh, you this. Uh, basically, bit cell loses charge when read, and over time as well. So read sequence is very similar to SRAM, except you need to uh, do the sense amplification at the bottom. Because, uh, because capacitor is discharged, and capacitor actually carries very small charge. The small charge needs to be sensed. And you can think of that sense amplifier as an SRAM, as an array, as a row of SRAM cells. And that's usually what it is. Okay. And after that, of course, all bit lines need to be pre-charged. Uh, uh, two properties. One is, reads are destructive here, right? When you read a cell, you discharge the capacitor, which means that the capacitor is gone at the end. Uh, the, the data that you had over there is gone, which means that you need to somehow restore it. How do you restore it? Well, pre-charging actually restores the data. Uh, and you get charge loss over time, uh, and which means that a DRAM controller must periodically read each row uh, within some allowed refresh time, uh, such that the charge is re restored. And this actually consumes energy. So even if you're not using reading your memory, you need to be refreshing the DRAM. Right? And we'll see that this is actually a, a big problem as we uh, go into the future and try to uh, uh, increase the capacity of the DRAM chips. Okay, just to summarize, uh, DRAM is slower. It has higher density. It has lower cost, but it requires refresh. And manufacturing it requires putting the capacitor and the logic together. So it's, an, it's a different manufacturing process. And if you want to, it's optimized for minimizing its capacitor, which means that as you keep adding logic, it becomes more expensive. This is one of the reasons why processing is not easily done in DRAM because uh, the process is optimized for that capacitor itself 
to maximize the storage. And if you want to, add, if you want to put adders, for example, on a DRAM chip, it becomes expensive. Uh, SRAM is faster. It has lower density because it has six transistors. It's higher cost. Uh, there's no need for refresh, and manufacturing is compatible with logic process. That's why SRAM has been the choice technology for uh, on-chip, right, over caches, for example. Okay, I think we've already looked at this. These are, this is some data, uh, but uh, you, can, you can study this on your own. But bigger is slower, faster is more expensive. Uh, I don't know if these numbers hold anymore. Any idea? <laughs> roughly, maybe. <laughs> Probably roughly. All of these scale over time. Uh, but these are the numbers. Well, I guess. Uh, and other technologies have their place as well. For example, flash memory is not here. Phase change memory, which is not mature yet, is not here. And they have their uh, place in terms of uh, latency and size, as well as uh, speed and cost. But because of these trade-offs, uh, we cannot achieve the best of both worlds. But we would like to. So we want both fast and large. The idea is very simple in a memory hierarchy. Right? How do you get both fast and large? Have multiple levels of storage uh, that are progressively bigger and slower as you get farther away from the processor. Now, once you have this multiple levels of storage, you would like to ensure most of the data that the processor needs is actually kept in the faster levels, right? So that you can access it quickly. So that's the idea of the hierarchy. Uh, basically, this pictorially, you have a fast and small storage, big and big but slow storage, and you want to keep things here, most of the things that you're going to access here, such that you get the benefit of fast. But if you're going to access lots of things, uh, this hierarchy enables this big part enables uh, you, you to have high capacity. And there are lots of trade-offs as, trade as you move over here. Uh, as you move uh, from the fast and small uh, to big but slow memories. And you can actually add more levels, right? Uh, because it may not be enough. Uh, this, this may be fast, but you may not uh, find the data here most of the time. So maybe you add another level uh, to uh, enable the probability of access uh, from this cache. OK. Basically, we're going to try to exploit something called locality of reference. You guys are all familiar with this, right? I'm going very fast, but you must have seen this in 2.13. Yes, who hasn't seen it? Nobody? OK. So I'll go very fast so that we can go into uh, the design of the cache itself. Basically, we would like to make uh, this appear fast and big. We'd like to get rid of the disadvantages uh, of each uh, uh, disadvantages of each level. You could think of this, uh, remember we talked about heterogeneity earlier, right? You could think of this as we're having heterogeneity in the system. So the, the idea is not all, it's not new. You really have heterogeneous components that have different characteristics and you manage them in a way uh, that gets the best of all worlds. This is obviously heterogeneous, and this has been employed for a long time in systems. OK, so uh, idea is to have a memory hierarchy, and there are lots of trade-offs in terms of latency, cost, size, and bandwidth as you go between the different levels. And uh, one thing we're going to exploit to get both fast, uh, to, to make this fast, is the locality of reference, right? And the idea here is one's recent past is a very good predictor of uh, one's near future. This doesn't always hold true. But uh, it holds true when uh, I look at you, for example. I, I predicted this based on the principle of locality. Uh, well, I guess for the spatial locality. If you just did something, it's very likely that you will do the same thing again soon. Right. Uh, if I'm lecturing right now, it's likely that I'm going to lecture in the, last, in the next five minutes. Right? So that's one example. Uh, well, another example. Since you're here today, there's a good chance you will be here again and again regularly. Right? In fact, it's more than that. There's another principle, spatial locality. If you did something, it's very likely you will do something similar or related in space. Right? 
to stretch your mind a, a little bit, every time I find you in this room, you're probably sitting close to the same people. In fact, you're probably sitting close at the same place almost, right? And that's true for most of you. Not all of you all the time, but <laughs> for most of you. So that's the idea. Well, spatial locality, if you stretch it, it's a little bit different. But basically, you have spatial locality among yourselves. OK. Uh, this is true for programs as well. A typical program has a lot of locality in memory references. Uh, temporal locality means a program tends to reference the same memory location many times, all within a small window of time. If you access memory location A, it's likely that you're going to access memory location A again. Right? In fact, registers exploit this kind of locality. Right? If, if uh, you allocate data that you're going to access uh, with temporal locality or frequently or within a window of time into the registers. We've already seen this principle. Spatial locality, a program tends to reference a cluster of memory locations at the same time. And no, most notable examples is instruction memory references. For example, you have an instruction uh, stream, and these are sequential, right? What do you do? You basically execute the first instruction, and you increment the program counter. That's the next instruction. Increment the program counter. That's the next instruction. So you get very good spatial locality, because these are cons in consecutive memory locations. Similarly, arrays, right? Arrays, if you lay out the arrays, uh, lay out an array, uh, such that consecutive data elements are in consecutive locations. And if you're actually streaming through an array, which means that you're accessing consecutive memory locations, then that's, again, very good spatial locality, right? Make sense? You've probably seen this in 2.13 also. But basically, the idea of a cache is to store recently accessed data in automatically managed fast memory. This is called a cache. Uh, the anticipation is uh, based on temporal locality. The data will be accessed again soon. Right. It's very simple. So when you access A, uh, memory location A, do not keep it in main memory, but bring it to this fast memory called the L1 cache and keep it there because you'll access it soon, likely. And I've given you the principle. And this is what the paper that I've assigned you uh, had in mind uh, by Morris Wilkes. Probably you re read that. It's only a three-page paper. Or is it two pages? Two pages, there you go. <laughs> My TA read it, <laughs> Justin. Uh, but uh, if you look at this, this was written in 1965. It says, the use is discussed of a fast core memory of, say, 32,000 words as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words in such a way that in practical cases, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. It's beautifully written, right? It doesn't say cache anywhere, but that fast core memory is a cache. OK, spatial locality, that's not actually discussed in this paper. But that's another uh, way of taking advantage of caching. Uh, basically, the idea is to store addresses adjacent to the recently accessed one in automatically managed fast, fast memory. So you don't bring in just A, but you also bring in A plus 1. Uh, when you access A, anticipating that you're going to access some of those blocks, some of those memory locations that are around A. That's the idea. So how do you exploit this? Well, uh, caches exploit this by logically dividing memory into equal size blocks. And whenever you fetch an address, you figure out which block of memory this address actually falls into, and you fetch that entire block. Instead of fetching only uh, four bytes, you fetch 64 bytes, for example. And what's 64 bytes? The 64 bytes uh, in which this four byte that, you're, that you need falls into. That's what you fetch. Again, anticipation is nearby data will be accessed soon. Now, you could think of this as a way of prefetching, right? You're not fetching just four bytes, but you're fetching that block that contains that four bytes. You're prefetching that material, that data, that you think you're going to need. So really, the fundamentally, caching is about temporal locality. Spatial locality gets benefits of prefetching, because you're really anticipating that you're going to need these other things and not this thing. So a large cache block, if you, if you increase the size of the cache block, let's say, this block size could be the same, same as your data, uh, the, uh, the amount of data that you're going to access. Then you're, going to, you're not going to exploit spatial locality. 
you just exploit temporal locality. If your block size is four bytes, you just bring in the data that you are going to act, uh, that you lack, you're actually accessing. As you keep increasing the block size, now you're prefetching more data into the cache. Because not, you're not only getting that four byte block, but you're getting 64 bytes, including that four byte. You could be getting 256 bytes, including that four byte. You could be prefetching an entire page. Whenever you need that four bytes, you get the four kilobytes into your cache. Now think about the trade-offs involved in this, right? What if you don't use that data? Because it's an anticipation. Uh, Basically, principle is nearby data and memory will be accessed in the near future, and I've uh, given you examples of this. And this is actually discussed in one of the earlier cache papers by IBM 36085. Uh, this is something I did not assign you. But basically, uh, 36085 had a 16 kilobyte cache with 64 byte blocks to exploit the spatial locality. Why they ran these array-based programs, a lot of the programs that were run on this was array-based, and you get very good, they figured out that you get very good spatial locality. Whenever you access uh, an element, later on you're going to need the next 10 elements. So why not have a cache that keeps uh, all of those elements? Okay, so there's an analogy that I like here. It's a bookshelf analogy. Uh, you can think of uh, the books that you're reading as part of a memory system, right? The book that you, I guess the books don't exist anymore, but <laughs> uh, what could it be? I guess Kindle? I don't know how to do that. But anyway, let's, let's go back to the books. Uh, you have a book in your hand. Uh, that's what you're currently using, right? This is your uh, registers, perhaps. Uh, and there are some books in the desk, and there are some books in the bookshelf, and there are some books that are in the box at, at home, and there are some books in the boxes at uh, in storage, far away. As you keep going down here, your capacity increases, but your latency of access also increases. And potentially your interest in the data also reduces as you keep going down. But recently used books tend to stay on the desk. At least for me, that's what happens, right? Uh, for example, hopefully computer architecture books are on your desk, or books for the classes you're taking. Until the desk gets full, of course, right? Once the desk gets full, that's the cache, that cache gets full. So you're exploiting temporal locality here. And once the desk gets full, now you need to figure out what to kick out from your desk. And we'll see that in the caches also. That's an important decision, actually. Because if you kick out the wrong book and if you need it again, then you have a problem, right? You, you need to walk. Walking is good for you, but uh, if you really need to get this book very quickly, you'd better keep it uh, uh, on your desk. And if you keep uh, kicking out the wrong book, you, you might be making a lot of trips to your bookshelf or boxes at home. Okay, uh, this analogy is actually interesting because now adjacent books in the shelf may be needed around the same time. Right? This is only true if you organize and categorize your books well in the shelf. Right? If you put your computer architecture books together, maybe you need them at the same time. Or maybe in some other way, if you somehow figured out the access pattern and put things, put the books that you need together in the bookshelf together, then you can get them together. So that's how you can exploit spatial locality better, right? If you actually put these things that you need at the same time much farther from each other, spatial locality doesn't work. That's the same thing as programming, right? When you program, if you, if you know what data you're, uh, you're going to access uh, around the same time, you can put that data close together in memory. That way you can exploit spatial locality better. And we'll see that uh, with some examples if we get to them. Okay, caching, uh, uh, the cache, at least the first level cache itself needs to be tightly integrated into the pipeline. And this is very important, this is a fundamental principle. That's why in that picture I did not show you the L1 caches. Uh, ideally, you would like to access this in one cycle so that dependent operations do not stall. Uh, and when you have a high frequency pipeline, you cannot make the cache large, right? But you want a large cache in a pipeline design, right? But you don't want to make this level one cache large because its latency is very critical. So the idea is add more caches. So you have another cache, level two cache. And this level one cache is very tightly integrated. 
OK. So, so far, I've kind of assumed that you need to manage this automatically, right? That doesn't have to be the case. Uh, you can actually have manual management uh, of caches, but then it stops being a cache at that point. Cache is usually used for automatically managed structure. So if you do manual management, then the programmer manages data movement across these levels. So a programmer says, move data from main memory to level two. Now that's visible to programmer, right? It could still be a cache, meaning that it's you, you exploiting locality of, exploiting the principle of locality, or well, hopefully the programmer is exploiting the principle of locality, putting stuff that's frequently used or likely needed soon, uh, and moving that from main memory to level two, uh, to the different levels, but it's manual. Well, the downside of this is, uh, it's too painful for programmers on substantial programs. This works if you know your program really, really well. Right? And if you can orchestrate that data movement. And people used to do this, like core versus drum memory in the 1950s. Today, it's still done in some embedded processors. Uh, and you can read about these. That's why I'm going through that relatively fast. Uh, for example, some embedded processors have on-chip scratch pad memories. That's the usual name for this kind of uh, Manual, manually managed memory hierarchies. You basically have, instead of this being called a cached, if it's manual, it's a scratch pad memory because it's visible to the programmer, right? And the programmer can address it somehow. It's, uh, it's different memory levels, if you will. Okay, automatic uh, hardware manages data movement across levels. Right? It's transparent to the programmer. And the upside is programmer's life is easier. The programmer doesn't need to worry about uh, where the data should go. Uh, now, the, there, there's a downside, of course. Now, the hardware's job is harder. This is, a, again, an, another fundamental trade-off that we've been seeing in this course. Whose life should be easier versus harder, programmer versus architect? In this case, architect's life is harder because now architect needs to figure out what should be cached, right? And uh, architect may not do a good job. Architect may say, oh, I'm going to cache Location A, if, if temporal locality doesn't hold, for example, uh, and if the architect designs the caches such that uh, it, it, it tries to keep the recently accessed data in the cache, then you get not so good performance. And in fact, you can lose performance by having a cache hierarchy because you get additional overhead transferring data between the hierarchies. Right? But uh, we'll see, uh, that's why this automatic management, how to manage the caches, what data should be placed into the cache and what data should be placed in different levels is very important. And people have optimized the management of this for years. Well, not years, but decades. Like for 50 years, uh, people have been doing research on how to manage the caches. In fact, at some point, uh, the, uh, the biggest conference in computer architecture, International Symposium on Computer Ar Architecture, people used to joke about it, saying uh, the acronym ISCA stands for International Symposium on Cache Architecture. Because caching is so important that managing that hierarchy is uh, people, uh, researchers in the uh, entire world dedicate a lot of their time as to how to manage this hierarchy. And we'll see some examples of this. But one heuristic that seems to work really well is keep most recently used items in the cache. Uh, this is called the least recently used principle. Right? Uh, get rid of the least recently used thing from your cache. And this is, again, based on temporal locality. So if you have this, now the average programmer doesn't need to know about it at all. You don't need to know how big your cache is or how it works to write a correct program. Right? But if you want a fast program, you may still want to organize your code and data such that you can exploit that hierarchy. And uh, programmers who are concerned about the performance of their code usually try to fit their data and code into the caches. Right? And we may get to that. Okay. So this is actually what Wilkes had in mind, right? If you look at this, uh, this is the paper that you're reading. By a slave memory, that's the cache, I mean one which automatically accumulates to itself words that come from a slower main memory uh, and keeps them available for subsequent use without it being necessary for the penalty of main memory access to be incurred again. So you look at automatically accumulates to itself words. That's, where, that's why caches, uh, when you say a cache, it's automatically managed. OK, so this is a modern memory hierarchy. Again, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Register file is actually part of the memory hierarchy also, except it's not automatically managed, right? It's compiler. 
or programmer managed. And it's very important uh, to manage that as well. That's why there have been a lot of research on register allocation algorithms. What should be put into a small register file? And what, sh what should not go there? And there's also uh, this other part, other boundary here, which is a swap disk and the disk itself, hard disk itself. Uh, that could be automatically managed also. But it's exposed to some programmer, which is a systems programmer. Right? OK. Uh, a little bit on latency analysis. You've probably done this before. But each level here has its intrinsic latency. Like L1 cache takes uh, some nanoseconds to access. L2 cache takes some other number of nanoseconds. Main memory takes hundreds of nanoseconds, perhaps. Register file takes sub nanoseconds. It could take 0 0.25 nanoseconds. Uh, this intrinsic latency, uh, you get the intrinsic latency when you access and hit in that level. Right? If you miss in that level, then you get the latency of whatever is remaining. So you can have a recursive equation that gives you uh, the latency of the entire hierarchy. Right? I guess I'll put down that recursive equation here. Basically, uh, that's the, this is the recursive equation, right? The time taken. Uh, to access something is the time taken to access level i. This is the intrinsic latency. Plus uh, the hit rate, uh, well, I guess, mm, well, I guess uh, you don't, not all accesses uh, are this way, right? Plus how often do you actually hit in this level, right? This is the hit rate. That's the access for this level, right? And you can write this as time uh, the next level, right? I plus one. I don't know if I did I plus one or I minus one over here. Well, I guess I'll do this uh, better in some way. Let me do this. Yeah, let me, let me actually do this. So this is 1 minus hi. This is the miss rate. And you need to have the time taken to the next level, right? i plus 1. Does that make sense? Oh, that's right, ti plus. Well, I guess it really depends on uh, how you express this. Yeah, OK. That's right. This is ti plus ti plus 1, right? Because TI actually happens whenever you access it, you also do this. Actually, there is a better way of expressing it. Probably if you take the TI out of here, uh, that's what you get, right? Basically, time taken to access both hits and misses take the same time. This is the intrinsic latency, plus some fraction of the ad, uh, access actually miss. And when you get the miss, you get the latency of the next level whatever is required to access the next level. Now you have a recursive equation, right? And you start with T0, uh, which is uh, the access latency of your uh, first level register file. OK? So everybody clear on this? Because you've seen this probably before. Let me go through this quickly. So this is your recursive latency equation. Ideally, you would like to get the latency you would like to minimize the latency, right? Ideally, you would like to, your entire memory hierarchy to have the latency of the register file or uh, the L1 cache if you ignore the register file. But that's not possible in all cases because of what we've seen. You cannot, make, you cannot store all the data that you need. So what you, what you want to do is when you design the hierarchy, you have lots of trade-offs, right? You would like to uh, keep the miss rate low and you would like to keep the access latency to the lower levels or higher levels low. How do you keep the miss rate low? Well, now you have a trade-off, right? You can increase the capacity of the level. That lowers the miss rate, but that likely increases the intrinsic latency here. Uh, so you would like to lower the miss rate without necessarily increasing the latency at that level. So if you have... Mm, 
So you have some capacity over here at one level. You would like to lower the miss rate uh, that goes to the next level without necessarily increasing the capacity. So what do you do to, to do that? Basically, you need to do more effective caching. Right? Or you could have other techniques like prefetching. Before you need the data, you bring it into the cache. And existing systems employ both techniques. Uh, and we'll, we will get to prefetching at some point. Uh, but uh, that's one way of uh, keeping the latency at this level low while having a lower miss rate right? by managing whatever you bring into the cache much better. OK, so you'd also like to keep this t i plus 1 low. right? So how do you do that? You would like to have faster hierarchies. Again. The same thing happens, right? If you want to have faster hierarchies, cost increases. So you need to do this, uh, design this entire hierarchy such that the entire system has somehow low latency at uh, a desired cost level, within the allowed cost level. So we, get, we go back to the goal. That's why it's recursive. OK, so the compromise is, again, inter intermediate hierarchies, right? You can have two levels, but if you have three levels, maybe you get a better hierarchy. Uh, that gives you better latency. Then the question is, how many, uh, how, ma how many levels actually do you, do you want to have in your system? And this is a very tough problem, because this depends on your workload. This depends on how you manage each level, uh, what data you bring. OK, one example of this, to just to put something concrete here, this was Intel Pentium 4. Uh, actually, one of the later generations of Pentium 4. I believe it's Prescott, uh, Intel called it. L1 data cache was 16 kilobytes. It took four cycles to access for integer operations. L2 data cache was 1,024 kilobytes, one megabyte. It took 18 cycles to access. And let's assume main memory is approximately 50 nanoseconds. Uh, if you look at this, best case latency actually was not one cycle. So this was very high frequency, 3.6 gigahertz. It was high frequency for its time. And now we have machines that have, they're almost six gigahertz, right? These are from IBM. Uh, but uh, that's why they uh, did not want to design a cache that could be accessed only in one cycle, because that cache would have been very, very small. That wouldn't have been 16 kilobytes. So they figured out that that's, uh, that cache would not have been effective. And worst case, access latencies are into 500 plus cycles. So if you actually use that equation that I've shown you, uh, these are the some uh, results you would get. If your miss rate at the first level is 10% and the second level is 10%, uh, access latency at the first level is 7.6 cycles. If your miss rate is only 1% at each level, access latency at the first level is 4.2 cycles. So you'd like to mi reduce your miss rate. Now let's take a look at a more interesting example. If your miss rate actually increases to 5% in the first level, this is the time to access the first level. T1, five cycles. So for all access, you get five cycles on average. And if your miss rate uh, is 1% at the first level, which is much better than here, but if you increase your miss rate at the second level to 50% from, uh, from only 1%, you actually get kind of worse latency here, but close enough. So you can see that you can get the same overall latency, almost same overall latency, by designing the hierarchy in a different way. Of course, this depends on your programs, right? OK. Yes? Are there, like, even though the average is only five cycles, yeah. there's a huge variability in there. That's right. And auto for execution, for example, could cope with like four to 10 cycles latency. But if you have to wait for 100 cycles, then probably you eventually run out of um, instructions to fetch, or at least cache instructions to, pre to our execute. And then you stop for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So even though it's only five cycles penalty, at least it sounds like it, uh -huh. it could be a lot worse performance. And that's right, exactly. And that's, that's a very good point. I was going to ask you this question later on when we get to something else. So this tells you the average access latency. Right? It doesn't tell you. Uh, how does this correlate with performance? What you're telling me is it's not the same thing as performance. And that's exactly true. This average access latency may be similar, but the performance you get out of the system can be very, very different. 
why this tells you nothing about how, how uh, can you actually tolerate that latency. Right? Here, maybe the system is more desirable because if you have out-of-order execution, now you don't have very long latencies. Right? You may be able to tolerate these short latencies because T2's access latency, if you look at this, is on average about 20 cycles. Whereas here, T2's access latency is on average 108 cycles. And it may be very difficult to tolerate 108 cycle latency with out-of-order execution. Right? You, may, you may run out of buffers, or you need to design a larger out-of-order engine. So that's the big caveat. Thank you for bringing it up. The caveat is you don't want to make decisions based on that equation that I wrote on the board. This equation is good for thinking, but it's by no means the entire performance of your processor. It just tells you what is the average access latency. So keep it as uh, that way in your, in your mind. There's nothing that can replace performance uh, as the final equation. This is just uh, to give you some of the trade-offs. OK, so let's take a break for uh, three minutes, I guess. Let's be back at 1.35, and then we'll start on the uh, cache basics and operations. So hopefully this was all basic material. Now we're going to go into the design of the caches, at least hardware caches. But before we go into that, caches actually, caching is much bigger than computer architecture, right? Caching is a concept that's used in uh, distributed systems, uh, the internet, like everywhere. You can have a web cache, for example, in your browser that caches the recently accessed pages in anticipation that you're going to access them again. And sometimes it could be painful because what if the page is updated? Uh, then you need some, uh, somehow somebody needs to maintain that coherence. Right? So the concepts that we're going to see are actually uh, very fundamental. It's applicable to uh, whenever you have uh, a trade-off between latency and size and you're accessing data, you may need something like a cache. Okay. But in, in, the hardware, in the context that we're going to uh, examine today, we're going to look at an automatically managed memory hierarchy that's based on SRAM. And that's the hardware caches. So that we can avoid repeatedly paying for the DRAM access latency, or access latency to the next level. So uh, some, uh, some terminology. Uh, one uh, thing that's, that I told you earlier is memory is divided into these blocks, right? Block is essentially a unit of storage in the cache. Uh, this is also called a line, uh, and I might use them interchangeably also. Uh, people call it cache blocks or cache lines. Uh, and the idea is these blocks that, are, that the memory is logically divided into can map to different locations in the cache. And we'll see that the flexibility at which uh, different blocks in memory can map to uh, the locations in the cache determines how effective your cache is. Uh, when data is referenced, a hit means if the data is in the cache, then you can use the cache data instead of accessing memory. A miss means the data is not in the cache. You need to bring the block into the cache somehow. And maybe you need to kick something else out to do it. Right? If there is no space in the uh, set of locations that you can put that uh, block into, then you need to kick something else out. And maybe when you kick, that, kick, that, kick something else out, maybe you need to write that something else back to memory. This depends on your policy of what you do with the writes into the cache, and we're going we're to cover that. Some design decisions. Uh, where and how do you place or find a block in the cache? This is placement or insertion into the cache. Uh, when, when you insert a block, where can you insert it? Uh, and how do you insert it? We're going to cover the basics. Replacement, what data do you remove to make room in the cache? What is the granularity of management? What are the size of the blocks? Should they be large, small? Should they be uniform? Uh, we'll see most caches are uniform because that simplifies the hardware. Uh, but that's not true for software caches. If you look at a web cache, for example, you could cache things that are of different sizes. Why? Because it's, easy, it's easier to do this in software, whereas it's harder to manage something like that in hardware. Right? And you can imagine that. 
Uh, write policy, what do we do about writes? Whenever you write into the cache, do you also write to memory? Or whenever you write into the cache, do you actually wait for the block, entire block, if you're writing four bytes, do you wait for the entire 64 bytes to come from memory? That's a design decision, right? Instructions versus data, do we treat them separately? And you could extend this actually for different types of patterns. Uh, you could imagine the programmer marking things in the program. These accesses actually have, likely have not a lot of locality, for example. The programmer can say that. And those may bypass the cache. So how do you treat different types of data? And as you, uh, as you know, instructions are a special type of data, right? From the very beginning of lectures. Uh, how do we treat them? Do we treat them uh, separately? Do we have separate caches for them? Do we have different policies for them in the caches? That's why the design space is large. And a lot of people have examined these questions. And we'll cover some of the basics. Uh, and if we have time, we can get into some of the interesting proposals. Uh, in fact, existing processors employ sophisticated techniques to manage the caches. Uh, we'll start with LRU, but the existing pol uh, processors modify those policies, uh, still based on LRU, such that the caching is more effective. So a cache, a hardware cache, uh, looks like this. You have an address to access the cache. And this address uh, is sent to a tag store as well as a data store. The tag store basically is for bookkeeping. The key uh, thing it does is answer the question, is the address in the cache? And also, it is, you can think of this as a metadata for the data. And the data store actually stores the blocks that are in the cache. And tag store contains the addresses of those blocks as well as metadata related to the blocks. Is this block actually, does this, does this location in the cache actually store a valid block? Did I bring something in? That's the valid bit. Uh, is this location written to? That's a dirty bit. And you may not need it in all kinds of caches. And we'll see that. So the main function of the tag store is to answer the question, is, this data, is the block that I'm accessing at this address in the cache or not in the cache, hit or miss? And I've given you this equation. Cache hit rate is defined as number of hits divided by number of accesses. And average memory access time is uh, what I've shown you here. Hit rate times hit latency plus miss rate times miss latency. Right? And you could express this as a recursive equation. And uh, I, we've already looked at this question. You can actually reduce this average memory access time and also reduce performance. Why? Because average memory access time, again, is not your performance, right? You can have some memory accesses whose latencies you cannot tolerate. You really would like to look at, uh, do you actually stall for this memory access? That's a, more, that's a better indicator of performance. OK, I'll let you think about that. We'll get back to that again. Uh, and there are many reasons for this, uh, for, uh, yeah, uh, for, for this latency tolerance. Okay. I said, I told you that memory is logically divided into cache blocks. And each block maps to a location in the cache. And it's determined by the index bits in the address. So we're going to divide the address uh, into three things, three portions. I thought I used one, and it's there. So we're going to divide the memory into equal size blocks. This is your entire memory. And we're going to use, you have these address bits. And part of this address will be used to index into the cache. This index tells us uh, where that block is in the cache. I, I guess let's, ta let's take this running example. In this case, we have blocks of, uh, this is a byte addressable address, and it's an 8-bit address. It's a byte addressable machine. And we have three bits that designate which byte and block, which means that your blocks are eight bytes, right? So we have eight byte blocks. If your block is eight bytes, that means that the bottom three bits are used to designate which byte within that block. And the next three bits, uh, well, next n bits, are used as the index. So we're going to use that, those bits to index into the cache. 
And the next three bits actually are the tag. Well, I guess in this case, it's the next two bits. Let's get back to this. Let's do the two bits here, three bits here. But basically, you divide your address into three portions, tag, index, as well as where in the block this address is referring to. And we're going to use those index bits to index into the tag and data stores. So what does the cache access look like? Cache access, you have this tag store. And you have this data store. And let's assume that this cache actually has eight locations. Or yeah, eight uh, different sets, eight different indices can be present here. I guess I didn't do it well. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the tag store and the data store. Uh, seven, eight. Basically, you take the index bits from the address and index this tag store. And that gives you a location in the tag store. You take the same index bits and index into the data store. That gives you uh, the location in the data store. Then the question is, uh, the, is the data that I'm looking for in the cache, right? That's determined by the tag. Uh, you basically, well, there's also something else. Is the block valid in that location? You check the valid bits in the tag store, and you compare the tag bits in the address with the stored tag in the tag store. So let's take a look at the running example. If a block is in the cache, it's a cache hit, then the tag store should have the tag of the block that's stored in the I index of the block. So let me give you an example. You assume, we're assuming byte addressable memory, 256 bytes, eight byte blocks, which means that you have 32 blocks. So let's say that this is 266 bytes and eight byte blocks, which means that the memory has 32 of these eight byte blocks, right? Eight byte blocks. And let's also assume that you have a cache that can store 64 byte data and eight blocks. And let's, uh, I'm going to introduce a terminology. You guys are familiar with direct map caches probably, right? Yes? Okay, so a direct map cache means a block can go to only one location. Uh, this means that there is only one location in the tag store and the data store that a block in memory can map to. And that's determined by the index uh, of the block. So in this case, you have eight possible locations in the cache. Any block in memory can go to one, only one of those eight possible locations. And how do you determine that? Well, block zero in memory uh, has some index bits, and this has the same index bits as block eight, right? Because you use the, these bits to index into the cache. And all blocks that have the same index bits are mapped to the same location in the cache. So index bits are 0, 0, 0 for blocks 0, 8, uh, I guess 16, and 24, right? There's no 32 because we, have, we go up to 31. Yeah, blocks 0, 8, 16, and 24 get mapped to this location. Okay. So when we access the cache, we index the tag store and get the tag out. And the next question is, which block is actually stored there? It could be any of these four blocks, which means that we need to compare the tag. The top bits, these blocks actually differ in the top bits, which are the tag bits, which should be stored in the cache. So you get the hit miss signal in the cache. So in hardware, what you need is you need a comparator. Right? And this comparator compares the tag bits of the address and the tag that's stored uh, in the tag store uh, in the given index that's also determined by the address. Okay. So this is not the hit signal, of course. You also need to check uh, whether the block is valid, right? 
So a tax store doesn't only contain, let's, let's look at what's in the tax store. Uh, you have a tag, certainly, but you also need a valid bit, right? And valid bit says, is the block uh, that's stored in this location valid? So you, get a, you gate this hit miss signal with the valid bit and get the actual, or this is a tag match signal, I'll call it in a better way. You get this tag match signal with the valid bits and get the hit miss signal. Make sense? So you need to do something in the data store as well. Uh, you may not actually want the entire cache block. Let's say, uh, well, in this case, it's an eight byte block. Let's say you're trying to access only one byte. Right? While uh, the tag store access is going on, data store is also indexed and the data, the block is brought out. And if you want one byte out of the eight byte block, basically you need to mux out the right byte. Right? And that muxing out is controlled by the bits that come from the Spiden block. I guess I'll call it the bib, Spiden block. Okay. Does this make sense? Was this all familiar to everyone from before? Okay. It's a good jogging of your memory after 213. Okay, good. So that's basically what a hardware cache looks like. Mm. Now, if you notice these green blocks over here, which are 0, 8, 16, and 24, they all contend for the same location, right? In this case, location 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, zero uh, location 0, 0, 0 in the cache which means that you cannot keep both of them at the same time in the cache. If you keep accessing 0 and 8 all the time, well, too bad. You can keep only one of them in the cache. So that's the disadvantage uh, of a direct map cache. It leads to a lot of conflict misses. This is called a conflict miss. Let's say you've accessed block 0. You brought in block 0 here. And how do you know it's block 0? It's valid at index 0, 0, 0, and tag is 0, 0, because the block 0's address is all zeros, right? Now when you access block 8, what happens is uh, the address itself is, uh, let's say 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Yes. Uh, well, not block 8, address 8. This is your address, this is what your address looks like. I guess I made a mistake, huh? Yeah, when you add us block 8. That's 8, right? Or did I make a mistake over here? No, that, uh, yeah, that, that, is uh, that is address 8 here. Uh, and what you get is this one, right? So these are distinguished between the tag bits here, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1. When you access address 8, what happens is it maps to the same location, but the tag doesn't match. So you get a miss. This miss is a conflict miss uh, because, well, uh, if you keep accessing 0, 8, 0, 8, 0, 8 continuously, they contend for this particular location, and you can only store one. And when you access 8, uh, if you had two locations, if you had two, of the, uh, two places where you could have stored this 8 and 0, then you would have eliminated that miss. So the problem is addresses with the same index contend for the same location, and we want to eliminate that. So how do you eliminate that? Well, by having... Uh, by having two columns of four blocks instead of one column of eight blocks. But let's take a look at the problem here. I guess I've gone ahead of myself a little bit. If you look at this, the problem is you have one index and one entry. And two blocks in memory that map to the same index now cannot be in the, present in the cache at the same time. This can lead to 0% hit rate if more than one block is accessed in an interleaved manner. So that's what I was uh, showing you earlier. If addresses 0 and 8 have the same index bits but different tag bits, they conflict in the cache. And all these misses will be conflict misses. 
So how do you eliminate this? Well, you can organize your cache in a better way, such that you have more flexibility. How do you have more flexibility? Well, uh, uh, you can eliminate the rigidity of the mapping between blocks and the cache locations. Instead of having this block to go to on only one possible location, have it potentially uh, go to two, two possible locations. And that's the idea of set associativity. So if you look at this, we had a single column of eight blocks, uh, well, over here in the direct map cache. We're going to change that to two columns of four blocks. And now what you can do is uh, you can, we're going to call this a set. A set contains of two possible locations in the cache, in both in the tag store and the data store. Now you can store multiple blocks that have the same index in the cache. Does that make sense? Okay. So what's, uh, now of course the downside is you get uh, more hardware. Right? You index into the cache and you do a tag comparison on both of the locations. And you need val bits for both of the locations. And uh, these tag comparisons can go in parallel and you can have only one hit. This way you can have block zero and block eight both in the cache. The upside, you can accommodate conflicts better. Right? The downside is it's more complex and slower access and you have a larger tag store. Why do you have a larger tag store? Because you need to have additional bits in the tags. Does that make sense? Because now you're reducing the index bits in the cache. Now, Taken this further, what if you actually have an access pattern, not like 0808, but instead of doing 0808, 08, now we've eliminated this problem, right? Now 0 and 8 both can be in the tax store at the same time. But there's another problem. What if you have an access pattern like this, 0816, 0816? What happens in this case? Well, in this case, again, you get conflict misses, right? Because you have three things contending for the same location, two locations. How do you get rid of this? Well, take this further, right? You can have higher associativity. You can have a four-way cache. This way, again, a location, uh, a block in memory can go to four possible places in the cache. Now your set is larger instead of having two locations in a set, you have four locations in a set. Now you can accommodate this pattern. You, 0, 8, and 16 can be in different locations here. Now, of course, if you look at this, this cache is becoming more complex. You get more tag comparators, right? And a wider data mux as well over here. Because as you compare the tag, you figure out which uh, of the ways in the data store uh, you get a match, and you need to mux out the data as well. Uh, the upside is now your likelihood of conflict misses is even lower, right? Because you can accommodate more access patterns. Now taken further, you can go fully associative. Right? Now this is a content addressable memory at this point. Uh, well, yeah, in, in, on the address side. Now a block can be placed in any location, any cache location. So instead of having this single column of eight blocks, you have eight columns of single blocks. And you can individually address them. Your tag store is now like this. So index bits are now eliminated, right? There is no index bit because you're not indexing into any location. Any block in memory can be placed in any location in the cache. Does that make sense? So this is most flexible. Uh, that's the upside, which means that your conflict uh, misses. Uh, you can accommodate many access patterns. You're only limited by the capacity of the cache. Uh, the downside is much more complex. If you look at this, every location in the cache needs a comparator, tag comparator. And its latency, your latency is higher, your hardware cost is higher, but also latency is higher because now, how do you determine this tag match signal? 
that tag match signal is not a simple uh, comparison anymore. That tag match signal is now a tree of comparators, perhaps, right? You need to somehow figure out which one matches. Uh, that hit signal is a tree of comparators. You need some, somehow or them, right? I guess you could do it with a wire door. But that's a long wire door, perhaps. If you have 16,000 locations in your cache, for example, then you get 16,000 of these uh, hit signals, and you somehow need to figure out a hit signal. And the data store is also, this MUX is also huge, right? So that's the uh, advantage, uh, the disadvantage of a full associ fully associative cache. I guess there are trade-offs related to associativity. One is how many blocks can map to the same index. That's the idea of uh, associativity. And how you decide it determines, is determined by what kind of performance you would like to achieve. Higher associativity usually buys you higher hit rate. Not always. Depends on your access pattern. The downside is it comes with slower cache access time. Uh, slower cache access time, cache access time is affected in two ways. One is your hit latency, determining that hit miss signal takes a while. And data access latency also takes a while because of the muxing. And more, there's more expensive hardware because you need to have more comparators. It turns out there's diminishing returns from higher associativity. associativity. This is the curve that you usually get in a cache. X-axis is associativity. Y axis hit rate of the cache. And as you add associativity, a little bit of associativity, you gain a lot of hit rate. But as you keep adding more associativity, your hit rate, the benefits are diminishing. And usually you get most of the benefit by, from going from a direct map cache to a two way cache. Of course, it's all average across many programs. Right? Individual programs can behave very, very differently. Okay. Any questions? I think I've gone through this relatively fast, but hopefully you know a lot of these concepts. Uh, let's, let's go into uh, some uh, more sophisticated mechanisms. You get diminishing returns from, in high hit rate from higher associativity, and you get longer access time. One question with associativity is which block in the set do you replace on a cache miss? Right. Uh, this, uh, there's a simple, uh, well, if there's any email block, of course, you should replace that. That's a given, right? You don't want to keep your cache not utilized. Of course, there, there could be reasons for this. Like if you want to keep, uh, keep some ways of your cache powered down, you may not want to replace things. Uh, you, may, you may not want to put things there. If all blocks are valid, you need to consult the replacement policy. And there are many replacement policies that have been proposed. One is random. Uh, you may want to randomly pick out of the set which block is going to be replaced. And you'll be surprised that this actually performs reasonably well. And we'll see some reasons for this. Yes? You mean reasonably well so you can outperform some other policy that's well thought? That's right. Well, are you uh, is a well thought policy probably, right? It operates on uh, temporal locality principles. But random sometimes does better. Maybe, maybe you can come up with an uh, access pattern as to why that's the case. Not right now, but in a couple of slides we'll see. Uh, it, you could have FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, you could have least recently used. That's what we've assumed. Uh, and we'll see that this is going to be hard to implement as you increase the associativity. Right? How do you keep track of what is least recently used? You need to have an ordering within the blocks of a set. So people have looked at uh, simpler mechanisms that approximate least recently used, not most recently used, for example or at least frequently used. That could be another policy. There could be other policies. If you look at this, this tries to figure out what is the use of the block. Well, random doesn't try to figure out anything. It just says randomly pick one. But some of these try to figure out what is the likelihood. They try to correlate the likelihood of reuse uh, of a block. But there is also another aspect of a cache miss, right? You want to, uh, by keeping something in the cache, you're eliminating the latency also. Your goal is not only to maximize miss rate, but you want to minimize the latency. So if blocks in the cache have different costs to refetch, then you may want to keep in the cache things that take a long time to refetch, even though you may not use them as frequently. 
but it's going to take, it's going to stall the processor much longer. And why could this be the reason? Why could memory access have different costs? Yes? You could have like a what? So in that case, that's a, that's a good question. We haven't looked at the virtual memory interaction. But if you get a page fault, then you're not going to even access the cache. Because your TLB says, this page is not present. And you won't get that. So that could be one reason, exactly. Because Size of the memory access. Assume that all sides are the same, if you assume that. But uh, that could be one reason. For example, some blocks may be present in the later levels of the hierarchy. Not that affects their cost. Right? You can get it in 20 cycles versus 500 cycles. Yes? If it is like a NUMA machine or something that memory is not uniform, mm -hmm. that fetch to memory from other processors could be much longer than. That's right, exactly. That's another example. Your, uh, in a NUMA system, you have multiple processors and memory is distributed. Maybe uh, the cache block that you need is in your local memory. That's fast. But if it's in a remote memory, a remote machine somewhere, even, that takes much longer to access. Yes? Uh, it could be replacing something that has to be written back. So that could take a longer time. You have write it back before every, I mean, uh, replacing it with a new memory. That okay. take much longer time. But that, that should not be on your critical path, right? You you may put it into a buffer. Whatever you're writing back, you just buffer it and then do the write back while uh, while using the location but it's still for anything you're fetching. Uh, additional uh, operations compared to just uh, fetching something and replacing it. You don't have to do a write back. If you don't have so what you're suggesting is keeping the cache things that it's, is not going to be written back. So that affects the latency of the write back. That doesn't affect the latency of the thing that you're going to fa fetch. Here. Shouldn't you figure out that something has to be written back and then actually do it in terms of that? Does it take some time for it to figure out that something has to be written back? So that's the dirty bit. In the, ca the, the dirty bit in the cache does that. I guess if you add like one more, like also this cost to lead to um, a big for that kind of way. Yeah. Be, you might need to snoop some cache line when you're evicted. It might cause you to not be able to um, fetch the next line until you snoop. OK. And then that could be slightly slower to evict. That could be true, actually. Yeah. But let's not go into uh, coherence right now. So uh, yeah, you guys have good ideas. Uh, but it's not. Uh, uh, yeah, if you, if you ignore coherence, then write-backs uh, should be off the critical path. Right? Because you're writing back the current access, and you can do that off the critical path. But if you have coherence, then there could be other issues, as you mentioned. So there's another reason why memory access have different costs, which is the overlapping of the latency. Right? Even though all memory accesses can take the same latency, sometimes when you uh, access a cache block, you can overlap its latency with other accesses that are going to memory. In that case, it feels less costly because you can tolerate that latency. Right? So a lot of the cases that you mentioned uh, are cases where the latency itself is different across cache blocks. For example, remote memory versus local memory. But even if the latency itself is the same across cache blocks, whether or not you're actually fetching this cache block and in the me uh, uh, concurrently you can fetch other cache blocks, have me other memory accesses determines their cost. If you have a serial, if you have an isolated miss that's a lot more costly than a cache miss that you can overlap the latency of. And you can have hybrid replacement policies also. Uh, you may not want to combine them, and we'll see one example. And what is the optimal replacement policy is always a good thing to think about. Let's take a look at some of these. Uh, actually, let's, before that, let's look at I how to implement the LRU mechanism because people have been concerned about how to implement the LRU, uh, especially when you have large, highly associative caches. The idea is simple. Evict the least recently accessed block, right? The problem is you need to keep, the, keep track of access ordering of these blocks. Yes? 
If you have a two-way associative cache, what do you need to uh, implement LRU? It's one, one bit, right? Yes, as you uh, mentioned. I guess one is enough to say <laughs> it's one bit. <laughs> uh, basically, it tells you which way is LRU, right? L least recently used. What about four-way associative cache? Because the question is how many different, you need to keep track of all possible orderings such that you update the LRU bits. Right? How many different orderings are possible for four blocks? There's four way in a set. Anyone? 16. I don't know how you got 16. I get 24. So if you think about it this way, you have four possible slots, two, three, four, and one of them is LRU, one of them is MRU, and you have the shades of it, LRU2, LRU3. Four cache blocks can be here, and once you place the LRU block, three cache blocks can go here, and once you place that, two cache blocks can go here. Once you place all of these, you can have one. Right. So it's 24. Yes? Do you necessarily need to like, keep track of everything? Like, they need to just, like, like the, there's like n factorial ways to like, have winners in a race, but uh -huh. like, you can just rank all of them. So like, you can still do it in like, two bits, right? You just, say each one is a counter. Uh -huh. And like, as long as you just update your counters on any axis, then you can do it. I see. So you, you're, you're basically saying counter uh, like access time. Basically, you keep an access time. So the, the problem with that access time counter is, uh, if, if I understand you correctly, you basically put the cycle time you access. Right? Uh, like, could you see, like, if you could do it with one bit when you have, like, two way associativity, mm -hmm. basically, like, if the bit set, you just set the bit on, like, so you unset that bit on any access and then the newest one that you just pulled in, you set it, and then you know, you just find the first zero and then you evict it, right? Yes. But how do you figure out what's least recently used? You need to have an ordering, right? So you could like decrement everything and then add one to like your most recently used one. Okay. And then like the smallest number. I don't know. It's really like that may be more costly in terms of number of bits, right? Yes, you had. Well, I, was just, I guess the idea here is saying is you just have to get counter, but you got there, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a counter, uh, you, you need to compare the counters, right? That's yeah. one. You need two bits for every single one, uh -huh. which is more than. Like, exactly, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you, th there, there are ways of implementing it, that's right. But you still need to keep the maintain the order. So you're basically suggesting a way how to as to how to maintain the order. So you need, basically you, need to, you have 24 combinations and the minimum number of bits you need is actually a five, right, total. So you, you have 24 possibilities of ordering. And if you want to encode all of them differently, you have uh, log 2, 24, right? And that gives you five bits. That's the minimum amount of bits you have. But uh, as you said, you can actually have two bits per cache block. Basically that tells you the order, but you still maintain the order. That's, that requires eight bits. But th the problem is you still need to maintain the order. And that order maintenance is actually, I guess I've already given you this. What is the logic needed to determine the LRU victim? That order maintenance becomes complex, especially when you go to 32 ways or 60, 64 ways, let's say. So people have implemented approximations to LRU. If you look at existing processors, most of them have approximations. Uh, most of them implement, don't implement this true LRU. I will call true ordering. They don't maintain the true order unless it's a two-way associative cache. Uh, with four-way, actually, it's not that bad also, uh, as we will see. Uh, the reason is true LRU is complex. And there's another reason. LRU is an approximation to predict locality anyway. Sometimes random does better than LRU, and we'll talk about it uh, either today or next day. It's not the best possible replacement policy anyway. So why spend a lot of hardware to get it exactly correct? Exact, correct is not the right word. Exactly true to the form of LRU. So we'll look, look at two examples. One is, well, three examples. One is not the most recently used. This requires you to keep track of only the most recently used uh, block, right? That's basically one bit. Well, one bit per block is one way of implementing it. 
Another way of implementing is you could have a pointer to the block, right? Which, which way is the most recently used way, basically. And then uh, you replace the, replace randomly uh, out of the not most recently used blocks. Uh, hierarchical LRU, this is another idea. Uh, basically, you divide, uh, it doesn't have to be four way, but you divide uh, a set into groups and track the MRU group as well as MRU way in each group. And we'll see the, an example with this. And there's another uh, replacement policy called victim next victim, which keeps track of the victim and the next victim only. So this is, a, again, another approximation. And these are all implemented in past processors. Uh, people do not tell what policies their caches implement anymore, but uh, it's very likely that existing processors use something similar to these. Let's look at hierarchical MRU, or I, I like calling this more hierarchical not MRU. Uh, basically, the idea is to divide a set into multiple groups and keep track of the MRU group. And within each group, keep track of the MRU block. So if you have, uh, let's say, a 16-way cache, this becomes more interesting as your ways increase. Uh, actually, with a four-way, it's very similar to uh, LRU. Let's say you, you have group zero, group one, I guess group two, and group three. And each of them have four blocks. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The idea is you have only one group as not MRU uh, or, or MRU group. And within each group, you keep track of what is the MRU block. So for example, in this group, this is the MRU block within this group. In this group, this is the MRU block within this group. MRU block within this group, MRU block within this group. Now it's much simpler, right? And the policy is this. A not MRU block in one of the not MRU groups. Right? <laughs> Makes sense. You don't, basically, you're not replacing uh, the MRU. Uh, well, you're definitely not replacing. It's better than not MRU because now you're grouping. And you're not replacing MRU things in any, in any of the groups. So what does it take to implement this? Well, you can actually do it in multiple ways. But one way is for each cache block, uh, ignore this four-way cache, but for each cache block, uh, you can have, is this the MRU group? One bit. And one bit designating, is this the MRU block within the group? That's one way of doing it. Now, this could be more or less costly depending on how many groups and how many blocks you have in each group. You may want to implement this in a different way, which is uh, a pointer to the MRU group, as well as uh, a pointer to the MRU block within each group. That could, that could take less bits, depend, fewer bits, depending on how, uh, how many ways you have in a cache. OK, I'm not going to go through this. This is one example that you can study. Uh, some questions for you to think about. What is, uh, let's say you have an eight-way cache with two four-way groups, and you have hierarchical not MRU. What is an access pattern that performs worse than true LRU? I think you'll, you can figure this out relatively easily. And what is an access pattern that performs better than true LRU? So it could actually be better than true LRU. I guess let's look at one more policy before we part, victim next victim policy. That's also an interesting policy. Basically, you keep track of only two block status in each set. Victim V and next victim NV. Uh, and all other blocks are denoted as ordinary, let's say. On a cache miss, what you do is you just replace the victim and promote non victim to victim. Non victim becomes the next victim, right? Uh, or next victim to victim at that point. And you randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim. It's simple. On a cache hit to victim, now you think that this is going to be the victim, but you get a cache hit. Now you promote next victim to victim and randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim and turn victim to ordinary so that it's not evicted the next access. In fact, it's not evicted the next next access also. So the goal here is you're kind of approximating LRU such that the block that you've touched 
currently is not evicted for two accesses. Right? That's the idea. And you can look at the policy more. When I cache it to next victim, you randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim. Right? What, what happens when I cache it to an ordinary block? Well, nothing, right? That's the nice part. You can actually save energy uh, with this kind of policy also. If you think about LRU, true LRU, it actually uh, wastes a lot of energy as well. And I have an example over here uh, that basically exercises uh, one of the cases. OK, shall we part? OK, next time we'll start with replacement policies and go a little bit deeper. And in the meantime, you can perhaps think about why random could perform better than LRU. <laughs>